A salary is the drug they give you when they want you to forget about your dreams. Welcome to the Corporate Dropout Podcast. I'm your host, Alessia Citro. After a successful career in tech, suffering from burnout, stress, and anxiety, I walked away from a multiple six-figure career to chase my passions and purpose as a coach and entrepreneur. This show is going to inspire, equip, and empower you to do the same. Let's get it. Hello, friends. Today, I'm interviewing Aaron George, tech executive and entrepreneur. Aaron is a regional sales director for one of the leading IT and DevOps data platforms in the world, and he's also the CEO of Vertical Profits. Fun fact, Aaron and I know each other because he was my manager at Salesforce for two days before I left for Google. (laughs) Aaron, great to see you again, and welcome to the show. Great to be here. I'm so excited for this. Thanks. Yeah, I'm so glad that you reached out and that we reconnected. This is going to be a great episode with a lot of value. I'll say too, you're pretty different than the typical guest that comes on this show (laughs) called The Corporate Dropout because you are currently working for a world-class corporation. (laughs) You know, I think one of the biggest value adds of you being on the show too is that there are so many people listening who are working full-time in a corporate setting and they want to start their own company and they don't know how to do both. So can't wait for all the nuggets that you're going to share with us. Absolutely. So I'm personally of the opinion to do things like you are, build up the next business or at least another stream of income before you become a corporate dropout and just jump off the cliff. You know, you don't want to get desperate or sell out when you're building up that dream. So Mm -hmm. to kick things off, let's start a little bit. I want to get an idea for your professional background because I, I think there's so much value from that and people just hearing the path and the stepping stones along the way. So can you give us like, what are the career highlights? How'd you start out? What were the major stepping stones, takeaways? How'd you get yeah, to where you absolutely. are today? No, you know, it's, it's really, I have a very eclectic, weird journey. Um, and, and the reason I have such an eclectic journey, and, and some people may not know this, is I actually don't have a college degree. Um, and, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. And so the reason I don't have a college degree is because uh, at the time I was in college, um, I had a relative with uh, that needed some help, and I actually dropped out to go move across the country and, and help them. Um, but, uh, you know, as I entered the workforce, I kind of had to do it in a little bit of a different way. And so um, as I started, you know, I, I come at it with a different lens because obviously people who are starting their journey um, or, her, or who are kind of in the process of just working at a company, um, you, you really come in at a couple of levels. And I always came in at the very bottom because, you know, obviously the, the college degree thing was like, oh, well, let's give him the entry level thing. Right. And so so my my take was always like, hey, I just need to go and just really, you know, bust my butt and and kind of work my way up from the bottom in every every place I was. And I realized quickly, too, um, because of that, that, you know, sales specifically was an area where I could be more performance based than I could with like marketing or something else that really did require the degree to kind of make your way up the chain. So, um, so I started that process. I started off with some commission only jobs. Um, you know, I almost starved, right? I, I mean, it was, it was quite the, quite the path. I started off in financial services. I moved, uh, I moved to mortgages, uh, until I find, and I did oil and gas, uh, until I finally found technology. And, and so for the last probably 15, 20 years, I've been doing technology sales, um, started off, um, really kind of as an inside sales rep, uh, you know, at a, large fortune 500 company, um, and worked there for, for a number of years, but really decided like, Hey, you know what? Like even, even in sales, I'm not moving up as fast as I want to. And I, I feel so constrained by the current role that I'm in. And so what I did was I, I, I looked around and kind of realized like, Hey, I'm in this gigantic monster organization. Like there's at the time I was there, I think there's 80,000 employees. And I'm like, I want something where I can actually move the needle because my my goal was always to be an entrepreneur and I wanted to take on roles that really would prepare me for that. And so what I did was I said, all right, well, I want to go from that to a seed stage startup and I want to just start from scratch, work within an organization. So I went I went outside. I did that for a couple of years, uh, built an organization up to the black from the red. Um, with my own personal sales, which was kind of cool. Never, never done that before. 
Um, and then from there, I got the call to, to move over to Salesforce, where obviously uh, we, we crossed paths. Um, and when I came to Salesforce, it was it was really weird as well, because um, I didn't go through the typical interview process. I mean, I, I went through this really bizarre kind of one-off thing. And I, I ended up going through 13 interviews to get in to Salesforce. Oh my God. Um, I thought five was it, bad. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was madness. And, and it, at the, at the very end of it, I was like, I don't care, you know, if you hire me or not, like I just not come into another interview. Like I'm so tired of this. Um, and so, so anyway, so I ended up getting it and I got, you know, what was really interesting about that role was um, I, I got put into a place where they said that you couldn't succeed. And they said, well, you know, the product that you're selling is 90% incompatible with your customers. There's a person who just left that job because they said, well, there's absolutely nothing there. Um, You can't sell it. And and so I, you know, I heard that that was sort of my welcome speech um, to to coming in. (laughs) And so, yeah. And so I was like, all right, well, let's, you know, let's rock and roll. Let's prove them wrong. And I just, I just kind of had that chip on my shoulder the whole time. Um, and so fast forward a few years, uh, I spent three years in that role. I built it up from, it was, a, it was a large enterprise role. So I was, I was covering the largest customers at Salesforce, you know, fortune 100 companies. Right. And that's who my customers were. Um, and I built it up from having one customer that essentially did like I don't know, sixty thousand dollars a year, and you know, in the, to, to building it up to over a fifteen or over a fifteen million dollar ARR territory in about three years. Wow! Um, and so it was it was really amazing because the way that I did it, I, I had to basically break every rule that they said I had to follow. Um, but once I did it, they said, "Ooh, that's great. We're gonna we're gonna take everything that you did, and we're gonna make that the new rule." Right. And so, so then I, uh, so then they moved me up into sales leadership. I, I took over a couple of national sales teams, uh, international sales teams over a couple of business segments. Then I moved over uh, to where I am today, uh, kind of doing the same thing. Um, but, but helping them fix a very gnarly go to market problem that they've got going on over here. Um, and, and so that's kind of what I'm doing today. Well, you know, a few things jump out at me about that. I think the one is like making something out of nothing, right? Do you think it was those experiences that gave you the confidence to take this leap of entrepreneurship now? 100%. Uh, you know, that was always my one, one of my big hangups. And I think one of, the, one of the biggest things that I learned early was when you are in a job um, and you want to go be an entrepreneur... Um, one of the biggest things that you have to conquer is sort of that fear of failure. Like what if I mess up? Right. And so one of the things that I did was I utilized the job to test out stuff that I would go do as an entrepreneur and then said, all right, that works or that doesn't work. And then I would, uh, and then I would just sort of build upon it. And then I would, I would look for every opportunity to really expand. Like every time I took a role at a new company or took a new position, I always did what I called a nonlinear move. Um, and really what that means is I would go from one business segment, let's say it was the large enterprise space, and let's say it was in the hardware space. And then I would go to software and I would also go to like education. Right. So it was just a very, very big departure. And the, and the reason I did that was because I was trying to get as much experience across as many different things as I could at one time. So I did that across a couple of, um, you know, a couple of different moves. And before you know it, all of a sudden I have all this industry experience across all these verticals and, and I can kind of talk pretty comfortably in, in most situations. Um, but I did that very specifically and methodically. And I, I had to pass up roles uh, to, to kind of do that. But, but in the end, I think it paid off. I think that's really smart because as an entrepreneur, you, I mean, you can speak to this too. I would love to hear the experience with, with vertical profits. You're wearing a lot of hats. You really have to have a broad understanding of the different areas in which a business operates and yes. you're going to be wearing tons of hats. So do you feel like that's really served you well as you're embarking on this adventure? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's critical for the kind of business that, that I 
am doing now, which is really essentially acquiring and partnering and growing and exiting businesses, right? And and so because I have such a broad viewpoint of all the different industries that I've served, all the different kinds of customers that I've talked with, all the sizes of customers, um, I kind of have a unique viewpoint into the stages of customer, where they are, what kind of, uh, you know, what needs to happen next to get them to the next level. And, and that's some of the stuff that I'm doing now. Oh, yeah. I, I think that that's so fantastic. So I'm curious too, um, you know, today you're leading this national sales team, started your own company this June. What's the balancing act been like? <laughs> uh, it's, that's been really, really interesting because, um, you know, the, the thing that's really fantastic about it is, you know, and I'm sure that you, you know this, Alessia, but whenever you whenever you decide, whenever you make a decision, you know, you, you've kind of heard this and seen this before, but the universe kind of makes way for you when you decide to do something right. And, and so I found myself when I, when I first decided to do this, um, it really came, was born out of a, of a mastermind kind of a class that I took and, and started kind of getting in and all that. And I felt like I had kind of walked into a room like where I wasn't invited because it, it was like, I, I felt like I was showing up to like a black tie affair and flip flops and a t-shirt <laughs> because I, I was all of a sudden in this room with people who were like venture capitalists who like there, this one person that I work with pretty closely now, he owns over 40 businesses um, and, and does a bunch of different things. And so I was like, how did I get in? How, how did I wind up with these people? Um, and, but, but it was really just that decision. And it's like, okay, I'm going to go do this. And then like, it was a matter of weeks and I found myself in this kind of group of people. Um, and so the, the acceleration that I have sort of seen on the entrepreneur side has been faster than I could have possibly imagined, um, because of that. And so, so it is very quickly sort of impinging on some of the, you know, some of the day to day, like time that you'd want to spend, but at the same time, um, you know, I welcome it because you've got such, uh, it's such a unique opportunity uh, to be able to kind of make that transition. But at the same time, like the way that I, the way that I sort of view my current day-to-day -day job is like, I'm looking to solve a problem, right? And if there, if no problem existed, there would be no need for a job. And so, um, so I'm looking at this in the sense of, I want to help this company before I leave really solve this problem before I fully move out. It's not like, oh, I'm making enough money. So therefore I'm going to go take off and go do this thing. It's like, no, no, I want to, I want to go solve the problem that I was hired to solve first. And then I'm going to go, I'll move full time and go do this thing. I love what you just said too, because honestly, that's been my favorite thing about entrepreneurship so far is I was just uh, doing an interview earlier today and I was sharing that probably about a, a month or so ago, I um, pulled a really late night. I was working on my website to like 3am, just totally like in the zone. <laughs> but you know, I like being able to control that. Like there are other days, like yesterday I worked, you know, just a couple hours and then I was doing, you know, some other things just for myself. So how, how much of that, like, would you say is really the motivator of why you became an entrepreneur? Was it like that time freedom and being able to control your day or what kind of kicked you off on this path? Yeah. I mean, I, from the very beginning, like when I was 14 years old, I knew I wanted to start a business. Right. But I just, the, the biggest thing with me is I just never had the confidence, um, mm. you know, and, and I sort of listened to the voices when I was younger. Right. I, as you mentioned, I don't have a college degree, or as I mentioned that. So all of a sudden it's like, Ooh, I don't have a degree. Well, maybe I can't start this company. Right. And I, I would just sort of, I kind of got in my own head for a while. I was like, maybe I should go learn. So, and then, and then it kind of morphed a little bit. And I think one of the interesting lessons that I've really learned is the longer that you're in a company and the higher you go in that company, oftentimes the harder it is to become an entrepreneur because you get used to a certain income and a certain lifestyle and you go higher and higher and higher and you're making more and more money. And now the money you have to replace to become an entrepreneur is more and more. Right. So if I had it to do over again, I might have never entered the workforce and just gone straight into it. And I almost starved anyway as a salesperson, like on a commission only job. So why wouldn't I just own the company? Right. So <laughs> that, you know, that, that's kind of what I if I had to do it over again, I would have started much earlier. But um, I do have a, a good broad breadth of experience because of it. But um, but, you know, that, that's one of the interesting takeaways that I've, I've come across. 
You know, something too that you've said that I think is super interesting and and something I just want to underscore. I feel like some people could see the name of this podcast, The Corporate Dropout, and think it's like a diss to corporate, which, you know, it's (laughs) not at all. I mean, it became clear to me that I needed to take a different path just in the wake of 2020 and, and coming to the realization about some things personally. But I feel like having that training ground in the corporate world and like you said, like the ability to grow your confidence while you're earning a salary and you have this stability, like that's worth a lot. I don't think that there's a better training ground, really, if you're somewhat risk averse too, right? Yeah, a thousand percent agree. And and one of the interesting things I've, I've mentored quite a few people, you know, along my journey. And, and one of the things I've always told them is, you know, never underestimate the value of where you are, right? Like look around you, And look at all the things that are going on around you. Like, and so in our example, right, like we worked at Salesforce. I know you worked at some other amazing companies. These are some of the greatest companies in the world. So if I want to learn how to company, how to run a company, I can just look around and see like, how did this, how how does this work? How does HR work at this company? How do, how do they do this? How do they do that? And I was just very curious and I was always digging into processes and digging into other things just to learn, like, how are they doing this? Yes. How how is the cheese made or the sausage made? Yeah, that, that's the thing. How is the sausage made? I'm usually pretty good with col- colloquialisms, but sometimes I get them mixed up. You know, and I, I just want to make one other point too to piggyback off that for the listener who hates the job that they're in right now or feels like it's beneath them or not a use of their skills or degree or whatever. You know, I so clearly remember loading the copy machine at my first job and mm-hmm. being like, this is so beneath me and my business degree or like restocking the fridge with the LaCroix and like all of them needing to be like, you know, facing the same direction and like looking perfect. Like all of that really set me up for today, whether it was attention Mm -hmm. to detail, phone presence, like all of it. So I think wherever you are just, yeah. Like what can be the main lessons that are going to power you in the future? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what advice do you have for the person listening who's currently working full time wants to leave, be their own boss, start their own company, but is like, how do I balance this? Especially if, you know, a spouse or kids are in the mix, because that adds a whole other layer. <laughs> yeah, yes, it does. And I, I have all of that uh, in the mix. So I, I can I can definitely speak to that. I think that, you know, the biggest key is, and again, I'll, I'll start backwards and work, work my way forwards on that question. The biggest key is you have to be in agreement with your spouse. Um, because if you like, one of the things is if you, if you want to go and I've, I've actually seen this before, you know, someone was working at a good job, they high high paying job. And then all of a sudden they just took a hard right and decided I'm going to go be an entrepreneur and didn't really kind of consult or get buy-in from the family. Right. And so then all of a sudden they're out here doing this thing. Um, the spouse starts to get resentful if things don't go well immediately, right? And they're like, you know, all of a sudden we're struggling. We have this great job, right? So it's it's uber, uber important to make sure that bef- like if you're in that family situation and it's not just you making decisions, that it needs to be a decision where they are supportive of what you're doing. Uh, so that, that would be number one. Um, but, but beyond that, I think one of the things that I would, I would say is what kind of business is it that you want to start? And then based on that, what, you know, how can you soak up and absorb as much knowledge as you possibly can before you actually step out and do it yourself? Right. And so there's, there's so many ways to do that. Um, there are, Facebook groups, there are meetup groups, LinkedIn, there, there's all these p- things that are so specialized and specific. I mean, there's, there's LinkedIn groups on people who national leasers of farm equipment and just, you know, everything you could imagine. And so one of the great, great things that I started doing was really just kind of popping into these groups, watching them, listening to what's going on, asking questions. Then I sort of move from there into, all right, well, now I'm really interested in learning more about this. There's kind of a level that I've hit there. 
Um, and then I found somebody who, who was actually selling kind of next level information about what I was really wanting to learn about. And so I, I then sort of got into this class and got into this mastermind. And that's really how things kind of took off for me is whenever I sort of took that next step, right, um, and put a little skin in the game. Um, and, and, and so for someone who's, who's in a current you know, job and you want to do that, that, that's a good way to do it, just to give yourself the confidence and the knowledge first of all, that you can do it. Um, and you, you kind of understand what you would do when you get there. And then from there, it really just becomes kind of working your way into the role as, as slowly or as quickly as you need to based on your needs. Let me ask you a follow-up question to that too. Uh, past guests, my dear friend, Jacqueline Samira, we were talking about starting up a business and she was saying it's so critical that it's something that you love and want to breathe every day, right? Because mm -hmm. if you don't love it and that's your business, like that won't be good. So did you also use these groups and this exposure to these different types of industries as a way to really verify that this is something that you were going to want to live and breathe every single day? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say I, I sort of did the opposite. I, I found a fatal flaw in myself in the process of doing kind of this, this you know, corporate journey. And that is, I get bored really quickly. Um, I, we I, have that in common, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, but I master something and then I get it going and like, I just, I have a ton of success. And then I, all of a sudden one day I'm just like, I'm bored. I want to go do something else. Right. And, and it's like, I just hit this thing where it's like the, all the juice and passion and the energy that I was doing towards something. Once I feel like I've truly mastered that thing, like, and I've, I've kind of hit the ceiling. I just, for whatever reason, I just, my just internal like motivation just goes away. And so that was one of the things for me personally, that really appealed to me about this particular thing that I'm doing is because in acquiring businesses, I can go literally acquire any business I want and I can run that thing or, or I can actually not be in the day to day, but I can help with the architecture and the growth arc of that company and if I get bored with it, I just go do another one or I'll just go sell it or whatever. And so, so for me, it's, it's fantastic for my personality because I just have recognized, and that was one of the things that also really, really stopped me from, from stepping out on business ideas earlier on was like, it's like, yeah, this is a good idea, but do I love it? And, and if I don't love it, I'm going to get bored fast. And if I get bored fast, then I'm going to be stuck in this company that I own that I don't like. And then what am I going to do? Right. And I just, I got in this sort of like infinite loop of that. Um, and so that was one of the things that where this really resonated with me is like, Hey, I don't have to be in this one specific thing for the rest of my life. I can go do a bunch of things and that, that works for me. Well, now my ears really perked up because I'm the exact same way. Like <laughs> It's bad. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. So let's, let's shift gears then into present day, this company that you founded vertical profits. Mm -hmm. yep. So you shared a little bit about this with me over a DM that it's basically entrepreneur hacking, I think is the way that you put it. So <laughs> you buy an existing business with no money out of pocket. I need to know more about that, by the way. And there's a success rate of 90% after three years versus the inverse. If you start a company from scratch, it's a 90% failure rate after three years. So tell us yeah. how this works. I'm yeah. super so, intrigued. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really great question. Um, one of the things that I truly love about this is when, when it comes to businesses and it comes to finance and it comes to just being entrepreneurial as just a way of life. Like there, you, what you realize very quickly, and this is one of the light bulb moments for me over just the last few months, is like, you can literally do it any way you want. And there's always going to be someone out there that needs something in a certain way or at a certain time where you can get things done on terms that might be a little unique to you know, to what you would historically do. And you see that oftentimes, if you think about real estate, I know there's probably a lot of real estate listeners that listen and they want to get into buying and selling houses. That's very common, right? Or, or fixing and flipping or whatever it is. Um, and you realize very quickly in that, in that realm that there's very creative ways to acquire houses, right? Well, businesses are no different. Um, you can, you can get in and acquire businesses 
in very similar ways with very creative ways, especially when you have um, owners who maybe they want to exit the business, they want to, uh, maybe they're bored, they want to go retire, they have shiny object syndrome, like, hey, I want to go do something different, right? They'd be like me, like 10 years ago. Um, and and so, so because of that, they are amenable to a, a bunch of creative ways to sort of exit that business. And it, and I think when people think about like, I'm going to go acquire a company, what they don't really realize is that that doesn't always have to be like, you're just dropping a gigantic money bag on the table. Uh, oftentimes that acquisition can happen over time. Um, and so a lot of times, one of the, one of the ways that I'm really doing things right now is um, a lot of times you can actually use the company to buy itself. Um, with assets within the company and, and different things like that, and so that th- those are some of the things that I'm doing. But yeah, you 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 sort of hit on something that I, I think is really fascinating, and, and that that stat that you threw out about you know 90% of businesses fail as a first time startup, and and you know I've never bought into that too much because I think if you're you know, if you're smart, you're savvy, you're educated, you've got some ex- experience in a specific field, like your odds are much, much higher. But the, you know, just the industry average says that. But the the industry average on acquiring an already profitable business in the space you want to be in is over 98% of those businesses are still going three years after you've acquired them. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great way. Like if you, if you know what space you want to be in, um, it's a great way to think about, hey, I could all of the sudden, instead of starting something from scratch and kind of going through that pain of building a brand and finding customers and doing all this stuff, like if I find a business that's been operating for a few years, they've already got a brand, they've already got customers, they've got a mailing list, they've got um, you know inventory, they've got equipment, they've got all this stuff. And all I want to do is acquire that and sort of come in and run it, take it to the next level. I've got instant paycheck, right? Like you're, if it's, if it's profitable, you get to pay yourself from day one. So for me, um, it just seems like a smarter way to go. Um, if you are sort of risk averse like me, so. I'm kind of risk averse too, but I think it's more <laughs> because of my husband, <laughs> Who like keeps me down to earth. Um, so, th- I mean, this is super interesting. I've never thought about acquiring a business in any other form than like what you said, like throwing the bag of money on the table. Can you give right. us, what would an example be of acquiring a company without doing that then to help us conceptualize this? Yeah, so there, there's a few ways that you can do it that are are really kind of very, they're very common, right? So I'll give you just a couple of really common ones. Um, number one would be uh, owner financing, right? So, so a lot of times an owner will be willing to finance the purchase of their own business. And so essentially what you're doing is you're saying, okay, Mr. Customer, I'm going to buy your business, just use a round number, I'm going to say a million dollars. I'm going to buy your business at a million dollars, but I want to pay you that million dollars over the next five years Um it, rather than just coming in and putting a bag of money on the table. And what, what I think a lot of people don't realize is that that is a very, very common thing in the mergers and acquisition space. Um, in, in fact, most deals, I would say, have some level of financing inside of them. So what's interesting is that depending on the owner's um, motivation to get out, Right. That some, some owners may say, oh, well, you know what? I only want to finance 20 percent. Um, and some owners might be like, I went out. I don't care. Like I'll finance 90 or even 100 percent to get out. Right. And so in that case, just that just asking that question alone, are you willing to finance um, just that alone? will you'll you'll cut the money that you would need to come up with to purchase that business up front by half, 80 percent, 100 percent. It really depends on what the owner's motivation is. So that's one super easy way. That's the, that's the place that you always want to start. Mm. There's a couple of other ones that are really common as well. Um, and again, when you say you want to purchase a business, you don't always have to purchase 100%. Um, you can purchase just a portion of it, right? So one of the things that you can do is um, another another great way is what's called an earn-in, right? So an earn-in is essentially where you bring expertise to the table. So let's say you're, you're someone, well, I'll just use myself, right? I, I've been in the technology space uh, for 15 years now. 
Um, I've been, you know, sales leader. I've done all these things. And so there are companies out there that are, you know, maybe in the technology space that need help with sales, or they might need help with um, marketing, or they might need help with uh, building an application and you're a developer, right? There, there's all these kinds of things that, you, that expertise that's needed. And so what you can say is, all right, well, I will come in and provide you these services, um, but in order to provide you the services, I want an equity stake in the company. And so by doing that, what you can actually do is you can say, all right, well, we'll, we'll do a benchmark. And let's say, you know, by, if you're currently doing, I don't know, $100,000 in revenue, if you hit $200,000 in revenue over the next whatever time it is, um, and I'm, I'm here to help you with that, then I want to earn into your business for 50% or 40% or whatever it is. Um, and it's all negotiable, right? So, um, so that's one way to do it where you can actually bring value up front um, and get paid in not only money, but also the equity of the company to help grow that company, right? So that's, that's another one. Um, another really common one, and I'll, I'll pause here, um, is what's called an earn out. <laughs> so there's an earn in, now there's an earn out. And an earn out is essentially, if, a, if uh, let's just say a business owner comes to you and says, well, I believe my company is worth $3 million. You say, cool. Um, market doesn't say that. It looks like it's only worth a million. And they're like, well, um, but I, I still think it's worth three. And you're like, okay. Well, so if, if it's worth what you say it is, then we could do what's called an earnout, and essentially, the the amount of money that they feel like the company is going to make in the next twelve months or twenty four months, if you actually make that, we're going to give you X amount of it, and that that component of it will be buying you out of the business essentially, right? So again, you're using the company's own money to buy it, to buy itself. So, um, so it's really fascinating and there's, there's, uh, and actually there's over 200 ways that I, I have, um, to, to kind of do this with no money out of pocket. So, wow. um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really a unique, um, way to do it. Now it, it's not, it, it works for businesses of a certain size. So you're not going to go buy Google with no money out of pocket, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. um, way too good to be true, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you're, you're talking about generally companies that have kind of gross profits or net profits of anywhere between a million and three million or three to five million is probably the top that you want to go kind of try in some of these strategies. But if you think about that, right, let's think about you as an entrepreneur wanting to start a business, you can do that and kind of build it up to a million dollars in, in revenue. Or if I can identify the right target and find the right conversation, I can get into a business that's already doing a million dollars today from day one and start my entrepreneurial journey with an existing system and company in place with customers and everything. So it's, it's really cool. Um, it's really, it's, it's a different way to think about um, entrepreneurship, but um for me, it really suits my personality and kind of just the way that I like to do things. And I'm also, I'm kind of laughing because it sounds like a far less stressful way to be an entrepreneur. The interview yeah. I did right before this, I was the one being interviewed and they were like, so what's it been like being a corporate dropout? And it's like, well, <laughs> now it's been three months and my husband's kind of like, all right, babe, like what's going on? And I'm like, it's happening. And, and actually just like an influx just this past weekend. Um, which is neither here nor there. But all that to say, that excitement can wear off when things get real. So this sounds yep. like a good way to bypass the things yeah. getting real part. Which it's, sounds great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's sort of like, it's sort of removing the barrier of entry to being an entrepreneur because you don't have to close on a business that you're not excited about and you don't have to buy one that you can't get into the right conversation for, right? So yeah. let's let's say, for example, so if I if I'm a let's just say I'm a person, I'm going to use a plumber. Okay. I'm a, I'm a plumber and I want to own my own plumbing business. Well, rather than me just kind of going out and breaking off from Roto-Rooter or whatever, you know, whatever it is that I work for today, maybe I start calling around all the plumbing businesses in my area. And I start asking them questions about, Hey, um, you know, are you looking at 
you know, retiring anytime soon? Uh, you know, are you like, do you like what you're doing? Um, do you, and, and you'll be, you'll be amazed at the answers to some of those questions. Some people might be like, Oh man, you know, I'm in this business. I've been wanting to get out of it for three years or, you know, they might have some sort of life event happen. Maybe there's a, a death in the family, a divorce, you know, whatever that, that changes kind of their stance on them wanting to be in this business. And so if you, if you can find someone with sufficient motivation, um, and it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean like you're looking for distressed companies or distressed buyers. It just means that sometimes people's goals change and their lives change. And so um, if you can find somebody who is in one of those situations, who's willing to sort of look at things a little out of the box to kind of exit their business, um, then a lot of times you can, um, you can do that. And, and one of the things I'll say is that I, I think what people don't understand is how, how common or how, um, how often you can do this. So I'll give you, I'll give you another statistic. So in the U S small businesses every year, there's about 2.4 million small businesses that go up for sale every year. Okay. Only 400,000 of them sell. Oh, wow. So that means that over 2 million small businesses a year are put on the market to sell that don't actually sell. So the owners of those businesses, for whatever reason, are going to be a lot more flexible to like try to get out of the business if they haven't found a buyer. Um, but the other thing is, too, it's, it's very similar to real estate. Um, you know, a lot of times the best deals are the ones that never hit the market. Like if you go and you go in and talk to somebody that, that doesn't you know, that owns a business that, um, that isn't for sale yet, but they've been thinking about getting out. You come in and you're like, Hey, you know, would you be interested? And you start this conversation all this, oftentimes you can get into a great opportunity that, that no one would have ever known about, um, before you get there. Mm, that's such an interesting point. So, so let me ask you though, if you're super busy, like I, I think about me and, and Jeff in this scenario, yep. both of us, like grinding. He jokes that, you know, yeah, you're a corporate dropout, but you're still in your office all day. It's like, well, yeah, but at least I, I like this kind of stress. But like, we're so busy, we wouldn't have the ability to call around and ask. How mm -hmm. would you go about finding a business? Do you get a business broker? Like, what would you suggest to try to figure out what? To yeah. Buy? Yeah. So I would, I would say, and I will, I will go ahead and say this now, business broker is not the way you want to go for this type of thing. Um, just simply because there there are kind of uh, very traditional routes and methods that you would go through to kind of buy a business. And, and one of those is like going and getting an SBA loan and then coming up with the other 15% or whatever it is. And the, the, the thing I don't like about that route uh, are really two things. Number one, you have to get, generally you have to give a personal guarantee, right? Like you're going to have to put up equity in your home or something like that to guarantee this business loan. Well, in this way, you're not putting up any personal guarantees. The other thing about a business broker that you really kind of want to avoid is that a business broker, oftentimes they, they'll, they'll kind of build their clients up to where they are expecting like absolute top dollar for their, their business and their company. And, and if they don't get that, then they're going to be like, no, I don't want to talk to you. Right. So, so oftentimes I will, I will try to bypass brokers um, and, and just speak to the owners directly. And if someone has a broker, sometimes what I'll say is like, Hey, um, very interested in the business, but, um, you know, it, when call me when it doesn't sell <laughs> essentially, <laughs> um, because, yeah. because quite frankly, and again, here's another interesting stat with business brokers. And, and again, I have nothing against the brokers or, or anything like that, but the, the reality is only less than 10% of the businesses that are listed with a business broker actually sell. Oh wow! Um, and, and it's generally and it's generally just because they are either asking for absolute top dollar, or they're not being flexible enough, or they they sort of put the seller in a position where they they have unrealistic expectations, and then all of a sudden they can't get the the perfect buyer that uh, you know. That, like sometimes a broker before they'll even introduce you to a, to an owner will say, "Well, I, I want to see a bank account that has at least three million dollars in it." <laughs> Okay. Why? Right. Um, and so it's just like, they, they want to make sure that you're a quote unquote real buyer when they just don't understand different ways of doing things. Right. Like they think you just got to drop the money bag on the table. Yeah. So, um, again, it, there's just, there's a lot of ways to do things. There's a lot of ways to accomplish things and people's goals and priorities are, are always different. They're always changing. And so one of the things that you can do that's really easy 
um, is you can just kind of start searching around on LinkedIn, right. For your area. Like if, if, Hey, like if there's a business that I found that, that, um, you know, let's, let's say I want to open a, a, a nursery, right. Like a, a gardening nursery. Um, and I find some nurseries around and I, I just start kind of pinging people, you know, just looking for some basic, like, Hey, you know, would love to talk to you if you're interested in, um, you know, looking at bringing on a partner or exiting your business or whatever. I mean, just, you know, whatever, however you want to reach out to them. That's one way. Another way that you could do, and again, this is really more of a local strategy, but there's ways that you can actually buy, um, lead lists from, from, you know, there's services and they're very inexpensive. You know, like I, I did one recently in, uh, in Houston where I, I wanted to buy, I, I wanted to find all of the, the gardening nurseries in Houston and, you know, there were a ton of them and they had these great lists where it was like, they had the, how long they've been in business, the owners, um, they had the, the owner's contact information. They had, um, how much revenue these companies made, how much, how long they've been in business. Like they had like all of this stuff and the, the list was like a hundred bucks. Wow. And so I was like, wow. Okay. More for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, th- that's a great way, right, to just give yourself a target list and say, hey, like, here's a list of targets I could go and talk to about potentially buying the company. You know, I'm interested in running this company or whatever you're whatever you want to do. Um, and it could be just a really easy way. And then you just you just tackle that list in whatever way you can and whatever time you can. And and, you know, eventually, as you know, uh, you've been in sales just like I have. It's a numbers game, right? Like if if I make 100 phone calls or I send 100 letters or I send 100 emails, I'm going to have, you know, 10 responses. Right. And of those 10 responses, I might have three people that are very, very interested. And of those three people, I might close on one. Right. And mm-hmm. so that's just kind of the numbers game of, of sales. And, and uh, want, that kind of kicks in after, after that. So actually, that's a perfect segue to what I wanted to ask you next. So I can see so many ways in which sales expertise would come in very handy with the business that you're doing. The other one, though, that I'm hearing is you need to know how to negotiate. Is that something that kind of came naturally to you? Or did you brush up on negotiation skills? Or talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so fortunately, uh, for me, negotiation skills are kind of part of the part of the the job description at the the highest levels of technology sales. Like, and you, you know, this dealing with contracts for some of these companies, it's just madness, like going through procurement and doing all these different things. So I have, I have sort of gone through the crash course in the school of hard knocks for negotiating. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are some very basic frameworks and very basic things that you can do. It's in, and what the way that I always sort of view this, right. Is, is I, I take two stances. Number one, when I'm when I'm in contact and talks with a business owner, I never want that business owner to feel like I'm adversarial in any way. I'm trying to take their business away from them. I'm trying to beat them down for for a uh, for a value, right? There, there's you never want that because if 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 they're not satisfied and happy with the results, and you're not satisfied and happy with with the result, then it's not worth doing. So what I do is I say, all right, how much do you want for the business? And they might say X, X dollar amount. Okay. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to take and look at kind of what other companies are selling for kind of in, in that industry or whatever. And that's pretty easy to find. You can Google that. Um, and if it's within reason, then you can say, all right, well, listen, like I want to get you all of the money that you want for this business, but I operate on the law of price and terms. And that means if you want your price, it's got to be on my terms. <laughs> it's a fair <laughs> and, trade. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, um, and if you want your terms, meaning like, hey, I want all my money up front, then it's got to be my price. Mm, right. Yeah. So, so it's a very, it, but you, you never want to get into an adversarial discussion in something like this, because if you do, even if, even if you get a business closed, Right. Like that person, that that owner going out the door can do all kinds of things to damage it. So you, you just don't want to get into that situation. Right. You want us to be a very cordial, amenable solution, something that that provides them with a great deal of relief or a great deal of security or whatever the case is. Um, and, and so there's a there's a variety of ways to do that. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, I. I work with people and help them. I, it's, it's actually really funny. I've, I've even uh, helped other people who are professional M and a people 
um, who, <laughs> who have been stuck in deals. I'm like, well, Hey, I do, I do creative deal structuring. And they're like, Oh, oh I want to talk to you. And they, they come and bring me all their deals and I'm, I'm helping them through it. So it's a very common problem, right? And it, even, even for the, the highest professionals in, in uh, M&A and all that kind of stuff. So I'm curious, mm-hmm. how can people work with you? Like is Vertical Profits just your company where you're buying and exiting businesses or are you also helping people find businesses to buy without the broker piece, it sounds like, or teaching them? Like tell us all about the business and how people can can work with you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I'm I'm pretty easy to find. You can either you can either catch me on LinkedIn or uh, you can my my email is just Aaron A-A-R-O-N at verticalprofits.com. Um, I, I, I had a website going up and then a, a, in typical entrepreneurial fashion, I didn't like the website. So I'm like having it totally redone. You know, <laughs> so, um, so I, the website's not up yet, but, um, th- those are two just simple ways. And listen, I, I am happy to, um, to help people, especially answer questions, um, or I, I can even help them do deals. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I, that I will assist with is like, I can, I can come in, in an advisor relationship. I can actually help people taking maybe a small piece of the deal or, or some kind of a fee or whatever. Like I can do that kind of stuff. I don't typically do like an upfront fee to, to help people do this. And the reason why is because that gets dangerously close to a broker. Right. And I, I'm not. <laughs> right. So what, what I am is I'm a partner um, I'm, I'm an advisory partner. I'm, I'm someone who can actually go in and help acquire, um, and, and get businesses up and running. I, I provide a lot of value to actually kind of juice the, the income and, and the revenue of these companies. But the other thing that you can do as well is once you kind of learn how to do this, you can actually take the same strategy you used to buy the business. And then you can buy other businesses around that business to help it grow. Mm. Right. Oh, so it's yeah. like, so you think, okay, well, I just bought this company. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it as what's called a platform company. And all that means is this is going to be a big, this is going to be a brand that I want to build out. This is a product or a, a set of services or whatever that I want to build. And so let's just say, for example, you know, I own a, a home construction company, right? Well, if I own a home construction company, well, another good thing that, that I know I'm going to need is I'm going to need carpentry. Right. So maybe I want to go buy a carpenter company. Maybe I want to go buy a brick company or a lumber company. Right. And I can sort of integrate all of that under this umbrella and you can just use this strategy and what what we call an acquisition wheel, where you essentially look around the business and acquire stuff all around the business. Um, you can do it with their suppliers. You can do it with all kinds of stuff. So it's it really is this this whole new world and whole new way of looking at things Um to, to kind of, again, shortcut or hack the entrepreneurial journey. Um, and, and again, every time you're doing this, you're lowering your risk, um, you're, you're net positive from day one, and you're, you're, really just, um, you're really just kind of taking that, that tough, whatever it is, year, two years of just grinding and not seeing a lot of results. You, you kind of get rid of that, <laughs> which, is, which is really appealing for a lot of people. Oh, totally. I mean, uh, Jacqueline, who I mentioned earlier, she has um, a Y Combinator company. She's killing it, but she went quite a while without taking a salary. So, Mm -hmm. you know, while I think that would be so amazing to build from the ground up, you know, it also sounds kind of nice to just jump right in and start making money right away. (laughs) Yeah. And listen, you know, it's, it's the, the thing that's really fascinating about it is, you know, I, I always I'm, I'm amazed at how many people that I come across that are like, I want to start, you know, I want to build, uh, you know, I, I want to start a new software company and I want to build this particular software. OK, well, let's just say it's like, I, I don't know. I'm just going to say a CRM just because it's on top of my head. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So I want to build a CRM. All right. Well, there's like 50 other CRMs out there already. So rather than you going through the pain of building one, why don't you see if you can buy one first <laughs> and then, and then maybe move and then maybe move on to, to building it out or whatever it is. So, um, so it's just, like I said, it's a different way to think. It's not, it's not something that I, you know, is, is certainly not a magic bullet by, by any means, but you would be amazed at the number of businesses that you can acquire grow in a very short amount of time. 
Um, and so, as I mentioned, I, you know, there's one individual that I work with, um, pretty closely right now, um, on a number of projects and, um, he started doing this three years ago and, and he's up to having bought and grown and, or sold almost a hundred businesses. Wow. In three, in three years. years. Oh my and, God. And that's now don't get me wrong. That's, that's moving. Right. That's, yeah, that's, that's someone with great time management that's, skills. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's moving. Um, and there's there's a there's a whole separate conversation about about that. But um, but the the point, moral of the story is to get into a single business. You know, if you want to buy a single business, usually you know it's kind of like doing a home loan. It, it might take you sixty to ninety days um, to get into one um, to do the diligence and all the stuff that you need to do to buy it. And then once you're comfortable with it, you, you come to an agreement, you get in, you, you take over ownership of that company. Um, again, that could be a 60 to 90 day thing um, that you don't necessarily have to be. Um, you, you don't necessarily have to be a, an expert or have a million dollars sitting in your bank account to do some of this stuff can be done with really like as again, no money out of pocket or again, very, very, very little money out of pocket. Well, this is so interesting. You've really got my wheels turning. I just heard the garage <laughs> open too. So when we're done recording, I'm going to have to be like, Jeff, what kind of business do we want to buy? <laughs> and not that we have time for anything else, but you know, you make it work, right? Uh, well, this was so great. So people can connect with you on LinkedIn or they can email you, Aaron at verticalprofits.com. Any other Correct. way that people should get in touch with you? It sounds like verticalprofits.com at some point when the website's up and running. Yeah, it, it'll be up and running eventually when I when I stop micromanaging it and get it to <laughs> I can release it. So um, yeah, it, the, but those are those are the two prior ways today, um, like I said. And um, and yeah, like I said, I'm 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 really happy to answer questions. You know, if you want more information, I'm happy to do so. Um, and, and if you do find something that you're really interested in, you say, hey, this really sounds like something for me. I'd love to go out and, and try to find X kind of business to acquire. Um, then, yeah, I'm happy to work with you on it. And, and we can, you know, we can work together. Uh, well, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on. And listeners, come back for the episode that drops tomorrow. Aaron and I are doing a mini business episode to give you some tactical takeaways. Awesome. Thank you so much for listening to the show. If today's episode added value to your life in some way, please subscribe, leave a five-star review, and share it with someone who needs this. I'd love to connect with you on Instagram and hear how the show has inspired you. So tag me or slide into the DMs. Find me at Corporate Dropout Official or Alessia Citro. That's A-L-E-S-S-I-A-C-I-T-R-O and two underscores. Until next time, remember that you're a badass, stay focused, stay hungry, and dare to drop out.